Hi, thank you everyone. Uh, let's, I think, get started. Uh, good morning. My name is Jim Showalter, Commissioner of Minnesota Management and Budget, and I'm really pleased to welcome you to the November 2022 uh, Revenue and Economic and Budget uh, Outlook. Uh, we're going to go through many data points here today, uh, and it is our habit. You know, it's, we do this twice a year, and uh, it represents the best financial projections based upon the best available information that we have at that point in time. I want to start by thanking the fantastic team at Minnesota Management and Budget. Uh, a lot of them are standing back there. Uh, if you consider where this forecast came from, it is from the hard work of people at MMB, at state agencies across the, uh, the state, many agencies contributing data and important analysis to the forecast that you're going to be listening to today. Uh, many of you have been following the good news contained in our monthly revenue reports. For many months now, we've seen revenue collections exceed expectations. And now we have some more positive news to share with you today. But with a caveat, economic headwinds are coming our way. In this briefing, we'll talk about what led us to the largest projected balance in the history of Minnesota. But we'll also talk about inflation, we'll talk about a mild recession, We'll even talk about slowing economic growth. COVID also isn't too far behind us. We've been in a period of flux, something Minnesotans know all too well. But at the level of the state budget, this forecast finds us settling into a little bit more normalcy after strong economic shocks have played out both on the national and the global level. So here's the key points from today's forecast. You're going to hear a lot of facts and figures today. It's a lot for anyone to take in. So the, some of the key points I want to make sure you take away from today's briefing. In the current biennium in 22 and 23, we continue to see strong revenue collections. On the expenditure side, we're now projecting less spending than previous session est end of session estimates. Taken together, we anticipate an additional $5 billion will fall to the bottom line. The $5 billion, coupled with the $7 billion that we left session with, mean that we start the upcoming budget period with a balance of $12 billion. By the end of the, that budget period, that number is expected to grow by another $6 billion to the total of 18. As we take our first look at the long-term outlook that includes fiscal years 26 and 27, we ex continue to see structural surplus, meaning that revenues are expected to continue exceeding projected spending. And this is where a quick reminder is warranted. We always mention that our budget forecast does not include the impact of inflation. It's based on current law. Normally, that is not a big deal. Inflation is relatively low. But in today's forecast, it is important to take a look at those numbers. The structural balance looks much different if you include any estimate of the impact of inflation. And by different, I mean smaller. So uh, before we dive into the detail, I want to unpack that $18 billion balance that we're projecting for fiscal years 24 and 25. On this graphic, you get sort of the simplest, highest level look at uh, what, where we're at with this budget. I'm going to unpack a couple of budgetary concepts first. One is projected balance. What does that mean? It is really two pieces. The first is the amount available or left over from previous years. We commonly refer to that as carry forward. The second part is what's generated, the money generated in that budget period. That number is what we get when we subtract anticipated spending from anticipated revenues. Piece those two together, you get the projected balance. So on this graph, you see where we were and where we anticipate going in this forecast. On the left-hand side, you see the end of the most recent legislative session. We estimated that we'd have about $7 billion in carry forward from the 22-23 biennium. We also expected to generate another $5 billion in the 24-25 biennium. Add those together, we had a starting point for this forecast of $12 billion, an unusually large number. 
On the right hand you'll side, on the right hand side, you'll see what this forecast adds to that set of figures. We expect the carry forward to be $5 billion more than previously estimated. So that makes the carry forward $12 billion instead of seven. The forecast also anticipates small growth in that structural number going to $6 billion instead of five. Combine those two parts and you'll see that we're projecting $18 billion over the period 24 and 25. That's an incredible balance any way you look at it. And also hiding in plain sight is a very important consideration. Most of the forecast changes carry forward, meaning that $12 billion of the 18 is one-time money. On this slide, we go a little bit further into the forecast summary, giving you a little bit more detail and some of the numbers that we're going to go into in further detail. In the current biennium in 22 and 23, what we're predicting revenues to change by $3.3 billion in the current biennium. Spending is anticipated to decrease by $1.5 billion. Add those two together, you see the change of $4.5 billion, $4.6 billion for this period. That rolls over and starts into the 24 and 25 biennials where you see the balance, beginning balance to being larger. There are, continue to be positive revenue stories and lower spending in the next biennial, but you'll see that they're smaller than what you saw in 22 and 23. We'll talk about that because those changes are not nearly as significant as they were in prior years. Together, we see a forecast change of $5.5 billion and the total estimated balance available for 24 and 25 being 17.6 billion. So with that overview, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Colin Bakitas to walk through the economic and uh, uh, revenue outlook for the state of Minnesota. Thank you, Commissioner Showalter. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm Laura Kalambukitis, state economist. I'm going to start with the U.S. outlook and how it has changed since February, move to Minnesota's economy, and then turn to details of our new revenue forecast, and I'll wrap up by reiterating some of the risks to this forecast. Since Minnesota's budget and economic forecast was last prepared in February, the global and U.S. economies have seen dramatic changes. These include the Russian invasion of Ukraine, high inflation, and six Federal Reserve actions to raise interest rates. As a result of these factors, the outlook for U.S. real GDP growth has weakened. Minnesota's macroeconomic consultant, IHS, now expects tighter financial conditions to weaken investment in interest rate sensitive sectors, such as housing, inducing a mild three-quarter investment-driven recession beginning at the end of this year. In the first chart, we are showing the IHS forecast for annual growth in real GDP. The light bars show IHS's February 22 forecast, and the dark bars show the history and the current forecast. IHS now expects annual real GDP to grow 1.8% this year, less than half the rate they expected in February. Real GDP is expected to decline 0.2% next year, so a contraction or negative growth in GDP as the U.S. economy moves through a recession with the U.S. unemployment rate rising to 5.7%. In February, IHS expected real GDP to increase 2.7% in 2023 and the unemployment rate to average 3.5%. IHS expects this will be a mild recession by historical standards with a 0.7% peak to trough decline in real GDP compared to the average pre-2008 recessionary decline of 1.7%. A recovery is forecast to begin in the third quarter of next year. They forecast real GDP to increase 1.3% in 2024, half the growth rate they expected in February. Slower growth is projected through the years of our forecast, with average annual increases in real GDP of 1.9% in 2025 through 2027, down from an average of 2.5% per year in the prior forecast. That slower growth in the, in the out years is due to lower forecasts for both U.S. productivity and the size of the U.S. labor force. Note that this slower growth is a forecast risk in itself. It makes the economy more vulnerable to negative shocks as there's less room for the economy to recover from a setback as when, uh, than when growth is faster. In the next chart, 
we, um, we're illustrating inflation. The height of the bars shows annual change in the consumer price index, or CPI, a common measure of inflation. Higher prices, including for food and rent, have driven inflation to what is now expected to be 8.1% this year. That's 3.6 percentage points higher than forecast in February. IHS expects slowing demand consistent with that forecasted recession, continuing supply chain normalization, and the eventual softening of labor market conditions consistent with that increase in the unemployment rate they expect. They expect all of those things together to slow inflation. They forecast CPI inflation to fall to 4.3% in 2023, 2.7% in 2024, and then average 2.2% per year in 25 through 27. <clears throat> this chart shows the level of the federal funds interest rate, which the Federal Reserve adjusts in their monetary policy actions. The solid line shows the history, the dotted line shows IHS's February forecast, and the dashed line shows their current expected path. So in response to that higher inflation we just mentioned, the Federal Reserve has raised this rate six times this year, including the last four increases being 75 basis point so-called jumbo increases. This is a significant acceleration from the path IHS forecast in February. IHS now expects the Fed to raise its policy rate to just below 5% by March of 23, reverse course in the spring of 24, and bring the rate below 3% in 25. This is consistent with their expectation that inflation will settle after 2024. In this forecast, higher interest rates, slow business investment, and they slow residential investment or housing investment, and you'll see that reflected in our revenue forecast in the forecasts for taxes that are tied to the housing market. And the higher interest rates also raise the return on Minnesota's general fund cash balances, which you will also see in the revenue forecast. Moving to the US labor market, in this chart, the height of the bars shows annual growth in US total wage and salary income. So this is a value that can increase if more people are working or if average wages per worker are going up, or both, and it's nominal, this means it can be boosted by inflation. IHS expects the economic slowdown to moderate the US labor market. They forecast US nominal wage income growth of 8.8% in 2022, a 0.6 percentage point decrease from the February forecast. The forecast for wage and salary income has been lowered for 23 and 24 to 4.0 and 4.1% respectively. This occurs as the US unemployment rate is expected to rise to 5.7% next year and stay above 4.5% through 2026. Moving to Minnesota's labor market, this chart shows the official unemployment rate for Minnesota in the dark line and the US in the light blue line. Minnesota has one of the tightest labor markets in the country. As of October, the unemployment rate was 2.1%, the lowest among states, and 1.6 percentage points below the US rate. The unemployment rate does not capture Minnesotans that have left the labor force, including retirements or those staying home to take care of, for, take care of children. Since the onset of the pandemic in February of 2020, Minnesota's labor force has fallen by 92,000 and the state's labor force participation rate has declined 2.8 percentage points. Despite that decline, at 68%, Minnesota's labor force participation rate remains high relative to the United States. It's 5.8 percentage points above the US, and it's the fifth highest among US states. There's strong demand for workers across the state, and there's low unemployment. So we now have only about four unemployed job seekers for every 10 job openings. This means that there's less slack in Minnesota's labor market compared to other parts of the country. This chart shows the annual change in Minnesota employment or the annual change in the number of people in jobs in the state. The dark bars show the history and our current MMB's current forecast and the light bars show what we expected in February. Looking at the light bars, note that even in the February forecast, we were expecting slowing employment growth as tight labor supply limited Minnesota's employers' ability to add jobs. 
So we were forecasting growth of 3.4% this year down to 1.5% next year. Now, with a mild U.S. recession in the forecast, Minnesota employment growth is expected to slow further. We expect job gains to decelerate from 3.1% in 22 to 0.3% in 23, 1.2 percentage points slower than forecast in February. We expect employment to remain flat over 2024, as workers who lose jobs are picked up by other employers, netting zero change over the course of the year, and then growth returns in 2025. Moving now to the revenue forecast, the first two columns of the table show our current forecast for the current biennium and the forecast change since February, and the second two columns show the same thing for the next biennium. As you heard from Commissioner Showalter, since February, general fund receipts have significantly exceeded our forecast. Those high, the, higher, the tax receipts at the close of fiscal year 22 were $2.9 billion ahead of our forecast, and so far in fiscal year 23, they're $415 million ahead of our forecast. So that additional or higher than forecast revenue raises the revenue forecast for the current biennium. Looking at the subtotal tax revenue line, total tax revenues for the current biennium are now forecast to be $2.7 billion more than the February forecast. We've raised the forecasts for the three largest tax types. Moving to the next biennium, but also but still focusing on that subtotal line for tax revenues, total tax revenues for the next biennium are now forecast to be $288 million um, less than the February forecast. Lower forecast for individual income and other tax revenue offsets higher forecasts for sales and corporate taxes. The impact of the expected economic slowdown is seen in the FY24-25 forecast for individual income tax receipts, which are now expected to be $975 million less than we projected in February. This change is primarily driven by, the lower, by lower assumed wage income, so consistent with that lower US wage forecast um, that I mentioned, and lower forecast growth in non-wage income. In addition, higher inflation increases the amount by which Minnesota income tax brackets are expanded. That has the effect of lowering the income tax forecast in the next biennium. For both the sales and corporate taxes, a higher base from the increased fiscal year 22-23 forecast more than offsets lower forecasts for growth in corporate profits and taxable sales. The corporate tax is projected to generate $832 million more in revenue than the prior estimate. While we have raised the forecast since February, again because of a higher starting point from the, from the prior biennium uh, forecast, the new forecast actually represents a decline in expected corporate receipts from fiscal years 22-23 to fiscal years 24-25. So we, in uh, February, we were expecting, or I'm sorry, in fiscal year 22-23, we're expecting $5.2 billion in corporate franchise tax, and in the next biennium, we're expecting about $4.5 billion. That occurs as the lower economic forecast creates drag on the corporate sector. Now looking at the line for all other revenue, among, uh, I'm sorry, looking at uh, the line for other tax revenue, um, among the other tax revenue, the deed transfer and mortgage taxes are both expected to generate less revenue than we forecast in February. This is due to lower refinancing and home sale activity stemming from higher mortgage interest rates. Now in the table, we've separated out all other revenue from the tax revenue to show that the sources for all other revenues are now expected to generate significantly more in both biennia than in our February forecast. $564 million in the current biennium, $560 more, $564 more in the current biennium, and $698 million more in the next biennium. This change is primarily due to an increased forecast for investment income, the return the state earns on its cash balances, including the budget reserve. Higher expected interest rates that we already talked about and larger cash balances drive this forecast change. So let me finish by reiterating some of the risks to this forecast. 
Inflation poses the most prominent near-term downside risk. While price indices have come in lower than expected in recent weeks, persistent inflation could lead the Fed to act more aggressively to raise interest rates than IHS assumes in their baseline outlook. This could induce a contraction in 2023 that's deeper and or longer than IHS has forecast. Moreover, monetary policy works with long and difficult to predict lags. Even if inflation and Fed actions follow precisely the path that IHS has laid out, that path could result in more job losses and lower GDP growth than IHS forecasts. Um, I noted that the baseline forecast calls for modest real GDP growth of less than 2% from 24 through 27. This slow growth leads the economy vulnerable to negative shocks, such as worsening geopolitical conflicts and financial market volatility, which could cause growth in the planning estimate years to underperform our expectations. The corporate sector and financial markets are volatile and they're dynamic, and in recent years they have not always behaved in predictable ways. It's difficult to estimate how much aggressive monetary policy and a recession will affect volatile income sources from these sectors, such as corporate profits and capital gains realizations. With 31 months remaining until the end of the 24-25 biennium, even small changes in assumed rates of growth in important income sources, including those capital gains and corporate profits, can generate large changes in the outlook for this biennium and the next. I'll now turn it over to State Budget Director Anna Mingi. Good afternoon. I'm Anna Mingi, State Budget Director with Minnesota Management and Budget. Thank you, Dr. Columba Kitas. I'd like to move us now to look at changes in the state expenditure forecast. This slide outlines changes in general fund projected spending in the current biennium, 2022 and 23, as well as anticipated changes in the upcoming budget biennium. Overall, spending changes are significant to our changes in the bottom line, though still relatively small when you compare them to total state expenditures. We are expecting about a 2.9% reduction in the current biennium and 1.1% per, reduction in the next biennium. So let's look first at those first two columns of numbers under fiscal years 2022 and 2023. E12 education, the first row, is our largest area of the state budget. It's projected to reach $20.2 billion this biennium, which is a $280 million reduction from previous estimates. This reduction is primarily a result of fewer than ex expected students, which I will ex discuss in greater detail on the next slide. Moving to the next line, health and human services spending um, expect is expected to reach just over $15 billion, a $1.1 billion reduction from previous estimates. This reduction is largely the result of additional federal Medicaid funds due to the extension of the federal public health emergency. But the savings on this line also reflect higher anticipated rebate payments from prescription drug manufacturers, as well as lower than expected managed care rates for our medical assistance enrollees. Moving to the next line, you'll see property tax aids and credit spending is relatively unchanged. But going down again, our expected spending for debt service is $43 million lower than previous estimates. This savings is primarily a result of slower spending on currently authorized state bonding projects, which has resulted in a smaller bond sale in the summer of 2022, driving expected state savings. All other areas of the state budget are combined $89 million below previous estimates. But I'd note that most of the savings isn't actually savings, it's just a reflection of where that spending shows up. Um, at the end of session, we reflected $190 million in appropriations to Minnesota management and budget for COVID-19 management. However, as those funds have been allocated to state agencies, their expenditures are showing up in different parts of the budget. In this case, um, much of that spending has shifted out of the all other line and onto the health and human services line. So in the current biennium, total spending is forecast to be $51.8 billion, or about $1.5 billion lower than end of session estimates. So when you move um, to the next biennium, our budget years, the total spending is forecast to reach almost $54 billion. 
When you look at the first row back at E12 education, you'll see this total spending forecast is relatively unchanged. But this small number sort of hides two big trends occurring in opposite directions. First, those savings that we saw from lower pupils continue into 24 or 25. However, they are offset by higher payments to schools through the compensatory education revenue. Um, the higher compensatory education revenue is a result of additional students receiving free and reduced price school meals, which drives that funding formula, which is largely a result of recent changes in the, um, in the processes the department uses to enroll students in free and reduced price meals. In Health and Human Services, total spending is forecast to reach $17.8 billion, a reduction of $722 million from prior estimates. The largest driver of this change is lower rates paid to managed care organizations that were ne negotiated for the upcoming calendar year 2023. However, in every eligibility category, actual rates for 2023 came in lower than previously forecast. You'll see on the next line that property tax aids and credits is $130 million above prior estimates. This change is a result of higher property tax refunds as property tax values have grown faster than household incomes. Spending on debt service and all other areas of the budget are relatively unchanged. So in total, these changes add up to a $600 million reduction in state general fund spending in the budget biennium. So let's look a little more in detail at the change in our pupil projections. As I mentioned, um, the reduction in projected pupils drives significant changes in state spending. This chart shows a 20-year view of actual and projected pupil counts, with the forecast expanded in that inset chart. Although the reduction in pupils is relatively small, it's about 1.5%, because of the sheer magnitude of this budget area, that drives significant savings. The Department of Education uses near-term growth trends based on historical data and other factors to project future pupils. And preliminary data for 2021 and 2022 shows that we had about 1.4% fewer pupils than previously expected. Because of the lower actual data, the forecast lowers the starting point from which we project future growth, which results in that downward shift from the dashed line to the solid line on the chart. But you may notice that in addition to that change from the previous forecast, the forecast just reflects year-over-year -year declines in anticipated future pupils driven by declining birth rates. This isn't a new story. We've discussed it in the past. I think the chart illustrates it fairly well. Also, now I'd like to move us to discuss the uh, impacts of the state budget from extensions in the federal public health emergency. As you heard, it was part of the large spending reduction in the um, current biennium. As a part of the federal Families First Coronavirus Response Act, the state receives an additional 6.2% federal match on Medicaid payments for every calendar quarter in which a federal public health emergency related to COVID is active for at least one day. Since March of 2020, the state has benefited from over $2.6 billion in additional federal funds. Our prior forecast assumed the expiration of the public health emergency in April of 2022. However, since then, the Secretary of Health and Human Services has issued three 90-day extensions. This forecast now assumes the state will receive additional federal match through March of 2023. If you look at um, the chart, it breaks the impact of this change across the two biennia. First, in fiscal year 2022, we um, project a net state savings from this extension of $603 million. And that is the outcome of two moving pieces. First, an additional $762 million in enhanced federal match. But in order to receive the enhanced federal match, the state must provide continuous in coverage for medical assistance enrollees. That means that individuals are not removed for coverage, from coverage except in a limited number of circumstances. This has resulted in higher enrollment, which drives higher costs to the state. But when you look at the following biennium, we continue to see um, slightly higher caseload as the state returns to normalcy and uh, works through for a 14-month renewal process which drives about $100 million in additional state costs. However, there is not additional federal revenue in the next biennium to offset those costs. 
So on net across the four-year time period, the three-quarter extension results in a state savings of about $500 million. However, the savings are not ongoing, and they're concentrated in the first biennium. Now I will turn it back to Commissioner Showalter. Thank you, Anna. Our last slide today is our first ever look at fiscal years 26 and 27. Our forecast anticipates revenues to exceed spending obligations throughout these years. What you see on this slide is also part of the reason we started by talking about what's the carry forward and what gets added to it. So you see in 24 and 25, about $6 billion being shown as the structural balance. That's the $6 billion that's added to the 12 that gets us to the 18. It's really important because when you see the $18 billion headline number, you think $18 billion all the time, recurring. $6 billion is actually the recurring part, with it growing to $8.4 billion in 24 and 25. This slide also gives us some information of what's not in the $18 billion bottom line number, which is the impact of inflation. That impact is a larger consideration for us today, and it, much more so than it has been in recent years. The numbers you see in this table help you to understand the impact of estimated inflation. Growth in our structural balance, the amount that revenues grow faster than expenditures, can almost entirely be ascribed to how we treat inflation in the forecast. This is going to be a challenge for our elected officials, and that's only one part of it, because there's additional pressure from the highest rate prices that occurred in the current biennium. We already had a budget in place then, but none of that general inflation figures in our, uh, general, in our spending numbers, even as shown on the slide. I'll say that again. None of that general inflation shows up in our figures for general spending, even on this slide. It's like the 7 and 8% price increases never really happened, except they did. Fortunately, as complicating as inflation and slowing economic growth may be, we are projecting that revenues will continue to exceed expenditures, and we will end the coming biennium with uh, healthy balances. To summarize, as we move forward into the next legislative session, Minnesota remains in strong financial position with a solid labor market. Despite the headwinds that I mentioned earlier, inflation, high interest rates, slowing growth, and continued concerns around COVID, Minnesota remains resilient and our budget outlook bright. While the bulk of balances we're projecting from a, come from a carry forward from previous years, our ongoing structural balances are also positive. As a result, governor and the lawmakers have more options than they have usually had to invest in Minnesota and address the needs of Minnesota's families, businesses, and communities. We will produce another forecast in February to ensure that our elected officials continue to have up-to-date information to aid in their decision-making this session. And that concludes our presentation today. Uh, at this point, I'd be happy to take any questions. Should go back into forecasts it was removed. Should it be back in? Uh, thank you for the question. I, whether inflation should be in the forecast, you know, it's a standing comment by the Council of Economic Advisors that inflation should be in part in the forecast. Uh, it's certainly been a comment that we've had from this podium for myself and others over the years. Uh, I'll let the lawmakers and elected officials uh, comment on that. But I think the key thing I want you to see is it's an important consideration. We need to talk about it because it is a, a driving factor behind both the structural balance and why it's there and also some of the pressures. $18 billion sounds like a tremendously large balance. It does. Yet, we know that there's plenty of families, there's plenty of industries, there's plenty of needs out there because inflation has eaten away at some of the ability to run programs and to help people over the last couple of years. From presenting budgets that put some inflation factors into the appropriations. I mean, you, you've had that opportunity in the past and haven't done it. That is correct. The uh, question is, uh, we have the opportunity to put inflation in literally into the program statutes, and that's correct, because ultimately there's a system. You know, this forecast, as I mentioned at the beginning, is taking current law, 
and adding to it the uh, understanding of the current law programs, revenues, and economic information so that legislators and the, and the governor have the best information to make those decisions. And they need some latitude as to what are those decisions, where to allocate resources, how to use that projected balance. So however we define the starting point, it's important to recognize that there's pressures and there's issues, uh, whether they're inflationary or whether they're built into the program expenditures at the outset. Commissioner, I'm trying to understand the, the contrast between this big number, almost $18 billion, versus the trajectory that you're raising more caution about. Is it safe to say that much or most of this projected surplus is based on past results that's already in the bank? And I think you said $6 billion is the amount that we can expect will kind of carry forward year after year. Brian, that was perfect. Uh, yes, uh, the, a, a, the vast majority of the uh, surplus today is coming from prior years. $12 billion of the $18 billion projected surplus is coming from previous year activities, previous tax years. As a result, that's great news. It's great resource uh, to start the budget period from. Much of that was available even last session. Going forward, we also have more good news of structural surplus. But, as you said, it is much smaller than the, the balance that's rolling forward. Let's see, the, the term recession was used, a mild recession mm -hmm. is forecast here. Can you talk about that in light of the burgeoning reserves? They look huge. Are, are these record reserves as well, too? Uh, regarding the recession and reserves, the reserves, is also known as the rainy day fund, are, are kind of shock absorbers in the financial world to make sure that when our estimates are off, when the economy turns in between decisions and uh, budget periods, that we have the ability to sustain what we're already got in current law. Um, our reserves are at record levels. They are adjusted on a regular basis based upon uh, current law and the projected size of the revenues and the risks that are associated with uh, our, our revenue estimates. Um, the recession, as uh, Dr. Colin Bakitas uh, mentioned, is anticipated to be a mild reserve uh, re recession, um, but we enter that with a very strong position a very strong financial position, very strong labor market position, and um, that's what we're building into this forecast. Commissioner, back on uh, the impact of inflation here. So am I understanding it right that if we factored inflation in, we'd actually be looking at just a 1.55 billion surplus? Uh, I, I see you're puzzled there, so I'm glad I'm asking you. Uh, or help me in understand just the numbers that you had on that uh, slide showing the impact of inflation and gotcha. what Thank the surplus would actually be if we were fully accounting for inflation. Thank you. Yes, I shouldn't play poker. I appreciate the question. Uh, the inflation uh, line there shows the estimated impact of general inflation in those years. So based upon the inflation rate that we assume in 24 and 25 or in 26 and 27, you would expect price or inflationary cost pressures to increase as projected spending by those amounts. So projected spending would go up by 1552 or 3309 in each of those biennium. And that would be the inflation that would be estimated in those periods of time. Commissioner, given sort of the dynamic you're talking about where a lot of the surplus is from past activity and there is some going forward but not as much, I mean, you're not going to be setting the budget, but do you have any advice for budgeting officials? Should they look more at one-time spending? You know, should they be looking cautiously at how they're going to use this money, even though it is a big number? Uh, it, it is, and certainly uh, the governor will be out here in just a couple of minutes to start to address and, and start that conversation about the budget. I think, you know, from a uh, perspect our perspective, obviously, you know, we always look long-term. That's why the state has a four-year planning horizon, to make sure that we're not overcommitting and we're able to sustain our promises. Uh, one of the most important economic factors that we have right now is the tightness in our labor supply, uh, the, the ability to really sustain our economic momentum. And I think things that we can do to make sure that we can do that, to keep people in jobs, to help families to keep going, is a really important consideration so that we go through this recession as lightly as possible. Uh, would you help with a couple of points of clarity here? First of all, the 12 billion of carry forward, how much of that is in the bank? Uh, 
already. Question is how much of the $12 billion is in the bank already? I don't have a precise number. I'm looking at the budget director in case there is a precise number, but you can, it's, right now we have balances that are in this neighborhood. So I think for purposes of discussing it, I would consider this to be a very reasonable figure of what's in the bank coming into this budget. The 12 billion. Yeah. Okay. And then the second point of clarity is this back on the inflation numbers for 24, 25. So we should subtract out the $1.55 billion impact of inflation from the six if we were to, okay. Exactly. You're, you're nodding. So yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, Commissioner, could you or any of the smart folks you brought with you um, tell us if you can recall a five-year window that had a structural positive balance. Is that unprecedented that you looked out five years with positive numbers? Certainly not unprecedented. I'm checking if... Well, usually when the out years, you've got deficits, you know, in the out budget, at least the first out budget or the two out budgets. There's often, which is what, what which was one reason why inflation was such a big issue. People would say, hey, yeah, we've got a surplus right now, but if you go out next budget or the mm -hmm. budget after that, you're in a deficit situation. Here you've got five years yeah. with positive? Uh, I think let's follow up after this is over because I don't think that's unprecedented. Pretty sure it's not, but uh, we'll, we'll go through the archives and make sure. Commissioner, Commissioner, um, my standard question: What's our state debt capacity? And uh, based on the fact that we didn't have a bonding bill last year, um, where are we at? Uh, the debt capacity report is a great question. Uh, uh, one of the documents you're going to find on our website. There's a number of supplemental materials that I really would encourage you to take a look at because. Even though I kept on talking about a couple of high-level things, there's a lot of uh, sub-stories inside of it, one of which is the debt capacity. The outlook is pretty much unchanged from previous forecasts. Uh, total debt capacity uh, is guided by three different guidelines. If you were to stay within all three of them, uh, you could bond up to $2.2 billion. Am I, am I reading this correctly, that the 26-27 surplus is going to be $8.4 billion? Is that number? Okay. Question for Dr. K, real quick. Just based on, on what you were saying, you're saying that we're either in or headed into, back here behind the cameras, behind the cameras. Oh, okay, sorry. We're either in or headed into what the consultants are calling a mild recession that will get out of potentially by September or so of next year. Is that right? Yes, they're, for, they're currently forecasting a three-quarter recession, so three-quarters of, of GDP decline mm -hmm. starting now. So yes, by, by late next year. And the second question I had related to the impact of interest rates. You're saying based on Minnesota's past prudence in putting money away, we're actually accruing hundreds of millions of dollars or of money into the state budget because we're making more off those, more or less the savings account of the state? Yes, that's right. It's the, it's the state budget reserve and it's that bottom line as and what, well that the commissioner talked what about. What was the number you said that we're, we're likely to accrue over this uh, forecast? So okay. it is, uh, I didn't give you an exact number for the investment income. I gave you the number for the all other revenues that investment income is part of. And so for the current forecast, it's an increase, a forecast, I'm sorry, for the current biennium, it's a forecast increase of $564 million. And for the next biennium, it's almost $700 million. And the exact numbers are in the forecast book. I can follow up with on that with you. Commissioner, can I get one more bit of a context on the record set? We talked about the, the, the records in surplus, the records in our bottom line, also records in unemployment. That was mentioned. Can you talk about that layer and how much Minnesota needs workers and do we need humans to come here? We've also set records throughout this time, too, in unemployment. Absolutely, although we probably shouldn't have switched spots because Dr. K is probably the, the person I want to have re refer to that. But let's just have a quick response on unemployment, and then I'll turn it over to uh, the governor and lieutenant governor. So obviously there's a lot of things about the economy that are uncertain right now, but one thing that we know for certain is that we need more workers in Minnesota, that we have a tight labor supply and extraordinarily low unemployment. 
And so, um, uh, you know, policies that can remove barriers to people working, continuing working, um, creativity on the part of employers uh, to search out those pockets of unemployment that we still have, um, looking to populations they may have overlooked, those are all things that can help us thrive through this period. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone.